Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker and our new chair of medicine at the University of Washington, Dr. Barbara Jung. Dr. Jung received her medical degree from the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in colon cancer at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center in San Diego, followed by internal medicine residency, gastroenterology fellowship at UC San Diego, where she joined the faculty. She was recruited to Northwestern University in 2009 and ultimately to the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2013, where she became the division chief of gastroenterology and hepatology. Dr. Yoon has asked me not to drone on about the details of her career and give her more time to speak to you all, um, but suffice it to say she has been a true success as an academic physician. She is a basic translational and clinical scientist. She is an active mentor and medical educator, and she is a fantastic clinician. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yoon, not only to the podium today, but to her new position as chair of medicine. Okay. All right. This is the first challenge. Not the last. Here we go. Yay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, yes, I'll just get me a short because my idea today was to start hearing a little bit about me. Um, I try to meet as many of you, and I'll continue to meet as many of you, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, small groups, big groups, conferences. But this is an opportunity for me to tell you a little bit about myself, um, about where I've come from, um, and where I want to go collectively with you. Um, I'm meeting some candidates in for Q&A, so I'm hoping we'll have an engaged discussion at the end. Is this working okay? So, go. Walt? Yes, okay. So I, this always makes me feel like a showmaster, but I will do that today. <laughs> I've also learned already that um, you either have to wear a belt or we'll have to find some kind of a device where you can clip this thing, thing, thing in so female speakers that wear a dress can actually walk around with this. <laughs> oh, yes. And I get enthusiastic applause from the back row, which tells me something, too. So um, let's start. And for those of you who have heard this, please indulge me, um, but I don't know how many have already reached, so I wanted to just make sure I sort of give a little bit of an overview. Um, this is me in Portland, Oregon, drinking, I want to say my first beer, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, my parents are German. Um, my father was recruited as an electrical engineer to work on a government project on the Columbia uh, River Gorge. And my mom followed basically because he said, you either come and marry me or you stay behind. And she decided to go and to her saying she turned 78 yesterday, she did not regret that move. So she became a college professor at Lewis and Clark College. Um, we then moved back to Munich basically based on the pressure of my grandfather because I was the first grandchild. So we had to go back. Um, I grew up in Munich, went to medical school there, and did a clinical thesis in esophageal pH monitoring in infants. Um, this led to an exchange uh, with Cornell Medical School where I spent a year as a medical student, which was really quite transformative, not only because I got to spend a year in Manhattan, which was a lot of fun, but also because I really saw the uh, U.S. system from the inside and really got to learn and compare. After this, I went back, finished um, medical school in Germany, looked for residencies, and at that time, actually, I have to tell my mentees who I try to help to focus and try to think what they want to do and have a plan, I applied for residency in ob surgery, and internal medicine. Now, the system in Germany is quite different. Um, I was very lucky, as I think we all are when we look back at our careers, where are these sentinel points that really shaped who we are, that there was one person I applied to who was a chair of medicine in a smaller town called Regensburg, and he had been to the U.S., and he had a vision 
of training physician scientists. And he had a lot of connections with the NIH there um, that had, uh, that's called the DFG, um, uh, um, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. And he would send a clinician or physician scientist to the U.S. for one to two year postdocs, bring them back, train them, and then have them be faculty. So a very U.S. model. And so he suggested I do that. And so I gave it a little bit of thought and um, also then recognized the opportunity of such and asked him what connections he had and what, what suggestions. And so he had two, one in UNC, which was inflammatory bowel disease, and another one in San Diego, which was colon cancer. And so hence, I work on colon cancer. Um, I wanted to uh, always point out that you know my, my love for colon cancer really was very serendipitous. It was really based on location. And I think that's OK. So uh, I started working in a very, very basic science lab. Uh, we worked on differential gene expression. This was a time when the arrays were just being uh, born. We made our own arrays. We had to figure out what to do with those arrays. We had to start uh, writing programs to compute what we found on the arrays. It was very formative. It was arduous. And I would say I learned a lot. Um, from there, I thought, should I um, continue? I really wanted to actually, because I didn't have a formal PhD, uh, get a PhD and stay in the lab and have my own lab and you know do a scientific career. But we were in San Diego, and UCSD actually had a physician scientist training program, and uh, so that piqued my interest. I I uh, assessed, you know, what, what is this? Is this, uh, is this something that would work for me? Would I want to be a physician scientist? And because I'd always had a real love for patients in the clinical side, um, I, des I decided to apply. It was a little bit of a gamble because UCSD had uh, not really been open to what was called foreign medical students at that time. Um, but I applied anyhow, and I was very, very lucky again, another uh, sentinel part in my career that they did, and I have to say, it, take a chance on me. I always try to find out what actually happened in that ranking meeting, but I got the spot, and I was then known as the resident that never complained because I really actually felt truly so fortunate to be there, and I really took advantage of all the opportunities that were afforded to me through this track. I short-tracked into GI. And I remember very well when it was time to choose a fellowship, which was basically two months into my internship. Um, I started thinking, so well, what, what fellowship should I do? And maybe oncology. Um, I did think about GI too because of colon cancer. And you know, I looked at UCSD and I said, well, it wasn't a guaranteed spot. So I said, well, what if that doesn't work? I should maybe apply more broadly. So one of the places I actually applied to was UW. And so I uh, got a wonderful letter back from a gentleman who's sitting here in the audience, Sung Lee, and we had, a, we had a discourse about this, and this letter was so thoughtful and instructional, and I kept it. I still have it in my files. It really was one, another one of those sentinel, um, sentinel career-shaping um, career moments. So he gave me lots of good advice, which I try to follow. Uh, I stayed at UCSD, finished, um, met my husband, Gerald, there, who is in the audience today, and um, who was working at UCSD, and uh, started focusing on hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And with that, had my laboratory focus on TGF beta uh, family signaling. Uh, joined my mentor's lab, who was a junior professor at that time, John Carruthers, who's now chair of medicine at Michigan. Um, was on the T32 through the training track, got my K08, R03, and then my R01. Um, so all this uh, remained a passionate um, teacher, um, was really engaged in the fellowship. I was associate fellowship director, and of course at that time, um, the associate fellowship director did everything, I have to say. We had a, we had a fellowship director, I actually can't even, I think it was John. But anyway, being a good mentee, which is a whole other talk, um, I, I uh, had the opportunity to really be very involved with the fellowship. I also helped with the PSTP program, which was really a lot of fun as well. During that time, our daughter Zoe was born. And then we moved to Northwestern because Gerald, after two careers, one in the military and one in academic outreach at UCSD, um, decided that he really wanted to go to medical school. So he went at age 35, and his match in emergency medicine brought us to Chicago. 
So when he matched in Chicago, I called um, three medical centers there and I said, well, my, my husband matched. I will be moving to Chicago. Does anybody have a job? And so with this, I ended up at Northwestern, although there was always a question, well, you're just looking. You're coming from Southern California. You're not moving. I said, well, no, I'm moving. I just don't know where yet. So um, our son Timothy was born. And uh, then uh, after a couple of years at Northwestern, the opportunity arose to um, become division chief at UIC, which I took. I want to point out here up there, this is our daughter Zoe and this is Timothy. He has since gotten a haircut. Uh, we, uh, we were told a couple of times that we had two beautiful girls, which didn't go over well, so he has shorter hair now. And this is uh, Gerald and me at Rome a couple of years ago. So my scientific journey, which really parallels um, well, all journeys parallel, but this is the, the parallel world of, of science that happened at the same time. I don't have to tell any of you that colorectal cancer is a very important um, cause of mortality. It's very prevalent. Uh, um, really, we will all know someone with colon cancer, um, or we already do, and it still is very deadly because 50% of those diagnosed will ultimately die of the disease. Um, there's a strong familial component. Really disturbing right now is actually there's a uh, huge incident increase in young patients with no genetic background, or at least discernible gen genetic background, that present with advanced disease. And again, we all will or know someone with this. So the genetics of it, this is you know, how everything started out. We're thinking about, well, what is the predisposition? How can we predict who will get this disease? Um, uh, can we, once we know, do a risk stratification? Um, I was fortunate to hear the Department of Medicine scholars um, at the last Grand Rounds, and I think the theme in general of all of us is how can we uh, personalize, how can we risk stratify, how can we understand the individual risk of a disease so we can target specifically. So I feel like we're all working on the same thing with one common goal. Um, at the time when we started out thinking about colon cancer genetics, we were really thinking of what are the predisposing factors. And knowing this, um, a big chunk, uh, uh, you know, and, and this is what it is in the textbooks, is still sporadic, which we um, ascribe to colon cancers that have no discernible uh, hereditary component. Now, I will say no discernible hereditary component because I feel like we're learning that it's not just the uh, germline mutations that predispose us. It might be stromal components. We'll talk more about that. But there's a lot of what we will call host factors that actually really shape our risk. So this whole pile is open for investigation. The familial pile also, this is, this is uh, people who have somewhat of a family history. Again, that depends a lot on how big your family is, how good is the family history. Um, but there's, there's definitely uh, a big subset of patients that warrant more attention. And then the uh, true genetic syndromes that have germline mutations. So I just brought this to illustrate how little we actually know. So this is a Lynch syndrome um, NCC and guideline version where you can assess general population risk versus mutation specific risk. And basically suffice it to say it's lots of organs and the risk is kind of all over the place. So if you think of this, uh, when I see a patient in clinic and I talk to them specifically about their risk, it's very difficult to ascertain. And especially if some of these risks mean that we have to do surveillance or more, um, this is what we need to learn more about. It's not like a gene really ascribes a specific risk. So what do we know about colon cancer? So in sporadic colon cancer, we have a step wedge approach, which is fairly well characterized, which is sort of the canonical way we think about how colon cancer forms. Now, we know that usually mutations in APC lead to growth, and then you have adenoma. If we can remove the adenoma, we can decrease colon cancer risk, which we do by doing colonoscopies and polyp removal, um, and then cancer forms. What is a lot less clear is once you have dichotomy of the pathway, so you see the adenoma in the middle, there's microsatellite instability, which is typical in Lynch. I'm not going to go into the details, but just to illustrate that there's multiple pathways that we have understood now. The lower one, including active and signaling, which I will talk more about. The upper one, chromosomal instability, the more common one, but lesser understood. Um, but even with this, we don't fully understand 
where the switch to metastases occurs. And remember, metastasis is really the part of cancer that kills. If we just had local growth and we could remove it, um, cancer would be, for the most part, curable. What we don't understand is once it becomes pro-growth, where does it become pro-invasion? And how early does this happen? And how targetable is this? And does this happen at the same time? And as you will see, we're starting to move away from the epithelium to modifying factors that allow this permissive environments or anti-metastasis um, environment, i.e. immune system. So speaking about this, there's been some very, very exciting work in the oncology field that's really transformed how we think about things. Um, here at the Fred Hodgson is going to be the STEAM plant will have groups of people working on tumor immunology together because it is really after big law um, become evident that we can harness the immune system to basically go back to where it was, which was keeping, keeping tumors in check. Now this works better for some tumors than others. Um, here is just an illustration of um, how the infiltration of the tumor with immune uh, cells can predict a colon cancer outcome. Uh, sadly, most colon cancers are sort of immune poor and don't respond as well. But for us, that's a challenge to figure out how can we uh, galvanize that immune system and uh, an opportunity going forward. So what do we work on? So this is the, on the right hand side, is the active and pathway, which is very closely related to TGF beta signaling. It's another ligand. It has an anti-active and folistatin. It signals through its respective receptors, actin receptor 2 and 1. Um, they associate and then they signal together with TGF beta through a canonical SMAT signaling. SMAT 2 3 gets phosphorylated, associates with SMAT 4, translocates to the nucleus to affect gene expression. So this is canonical. You see below it, there's also non-canonical and pro-growth because canonical SMAT signaling is growth suppressive. So initially it was thought that active and anti-GF beta are purely growth suppressive. So in our first work, some of the problems we encountered is that um, it was meant to be a tumor suppressor. So in the early days, we were very keen on labeling certain signaling components as something. It's either a, a tumor suppressor or it's an oncogene until we're learning that actually all these things can be all things at all times. It depends on the context and of course it's all very complicated. But suffice it to say is that active and signaling can signal growth suppressively and also pro-metastatically. So our first work we detected that it actually is commonly mutated um, in microsatellite unstable colon cancer, that is the Lynch syndrome pathway and others. Um, but it's also common in the sporadic one that I showed you that is more common. We also showed that it actually can enhance migration so that it may be important in metastases and this is clinically relevant. Um, and that active and TGF beta, although they use the same SMAT signaling, diverge when they look at, when they um, uh, affect mitogenic signaling. Further, this may be signaling through differential uh, mechanisms um, up and down regulating P21. Um, and it actually will have something, some effect on tumor-associated um, microenvironment, i.e. inflammation. Further, we're seeing that some of this will be uh, transferable to pancreatic cancer, another very important uh, solid organ tumor that um, is in need, in dire need of uh, new therapies. So where are we at now? Um, we actually think that while the tumor is, of course, very important and the center of all attention, um, the stroma may be actually the conductor of the epithelium. So what is happening in the stroma may actually determine what's happening in the tumor. So a lot of our attention, and that's not just me, the whole field, is shifting away from just looking at the epithelium and focusing more on what's going on in the stroma and how can we target the stroma, i.e., can we treat the active and secretion that happens in the stroma that is pro-metastatic and then prevent metastases. Now again, this will be very context and timing uh, dependent. It will, we will have to really be sure which, which patients we treat. We have to do a clear risk stratification and also phenotyping because you can think if it's growth suppressive and you treat early, um, you may get bigger tumors. Um, you might have other untoward side effects. So what we currently try to dissect is what is the interplay between active and TGF-beta signaling and uh, how it pertains to the stroma. 
Interestingly, activin is also very important in a lot of other uh, uh, inflammatory conditions, one of them pancreatitis, so that, that will be for another day. So in terms of future directions, that are what I want to leave you with, what we're thinking of uh, working on and where the field is going, um, cancer genetics, we feel strongly, uh, needs to involve the study of stromal regulation. Um, there's a variety of cells that play important complex roles, and the emphasis will be on complex. We will need better tools to understand those complexities and also outside of the single cell model. So it has to be, you know, in the context of an in vivo uh, situation because we need to understand the immunological component. And this will need and lead to in-depth studies and the cross-regulation of such signaling because we need to um, understand where uh, this respective patient is before we can do targeted treatment tools. And this will need collaborative efforts. We will need to involve the patients in this. Um, we'll need bioengineering to come up with, with new ways of targeting pharmacology to come up with new compounds and bring all this knowledge to the patient. So in summary, for um, us physicians, physician scientists, and scientists with a clinical bent, we, we will need to understand the not-so-basic genetic principles. This is going to be doctoring not just of the future, it is the doctoring of now. Um, there's big data, there's panel testing, we have all, all kinds of patients who come with sporadically found mutations that confer certain risks that we are not fully sure about and we will have to answer to this. And the specialty boundaries will become fluid with this. Um, we will need a personal approach. Uh, patients will be asking for that. Um, and we'll have to be able to discuss this and come up with personalized approaches that we modify over time. Uh, for me personally, this uh, clinical focus has been very rewarding. It really helped me to see my patients apply to my science and apply my science back to them. So with this, um, my scientific journey, I want to switch back to the department here and to all of you. So, I will start out with some of the challenges that I probably don't have to repeat to any of you, but um, that I just started down when I think of a big picture uh, future of academic medicine. And this, this was informed by my previous experiences as a division chief, um, me listening to people, coming here, trying to understand where we stand in general, seeing what's going on around the country. Um, but I think uh, staying afloat successfully, there's a lot of strain on this. How do we even, you know, stay in business? Um, why we can stay true to why we're here, I think is the biggest tension that most of us face. And um, the challenges, and there are many more, if I left some out, I uh, apologize, but rising personal costs, uh, especially in a place like Seattle, uh, student loans that are crushing for junior faculty fellows, um, the decrease in reimbursement in general, the need to be more and more efficient, um, the tough funding environment. So as an academician, so personally as a division chief, as a department chair, as a dean, uh, what is success? How, how are we successful? How do we define this? How can we say, oh, I'm running a, a successful group, or I'm successful in what I'm doing? Um, and I think that's a question that, that is very individual, but there are there should be a collective answer because if we can't define what success is for us, uh, it's going to be difficult to determine goals. I think once we know what our collective success is, uh, we can determine goals and we can also prioritize to get towards that. We can start thinking about what we may want to do less of so we can do more of what makes us successful. Um, it's well recognized that there's increased documentation burden. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities with electronic medical records, which I think we really need to look to the young generation to help us with this. Um, I can just say how my seven-year-old can navigate that iPad. I have a lot to learn, and I think the, the, uh, the data we have, we've really not leveraged, and all of you know that, but it comes with a lot of burden. There is widening healthcare disparities. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, and there's complex care that falls to places like ours that is largely um, unsupported in the coordination thereof. And um, I think one of the biggest challenges is provider, trainee, and staff burnout. 
So what are some of the opportunities? And these are not my ideas. This is basically uh, white paper um, ideas for the next five years in the, in the realm of academic medicine. So one big topic, and I just wanted to throw them out there as innovative ideas that people are thinking about, is um, uh, how do we think about care? So on-demand la learning and care, transformative technologies, so virtual care, there's a lot of push here for telehealth. I see Dr. Unitzer here who is going to be spearheading behavioral health and telemedicine, but uh, how do we do this best? How do we serve the patient? Um, how do we serve us? How we can use this in a scholarly way? I think are all wonderful opportunities, but they will come with challenges. Uh, when is this going to be done? How do we fit it in the regular day? Um, how is this built for? How, how do all patients will have equal access to this. So there's a lot of things coming down the pike that I think are very exciting, but also challenging and opportunities. Uh, flip clinic model. Um, that just basically means that uh, we think more about the patient. How does it look like for the patient? How do they get to the clinic? How is the clinic setting itself? And not just the clinic as a building or uh, a room, but in general, how is the experience for the, for the patient? You know, I saw at the SCCA, there are areas where basically the patient will just stay in the room and everybody will come to them. Um, the new diabetes center has a similar setup where the patients are in the room in the middle and providers come from different sides and basically get the patient what they need in a patient-centered way. But again, that takes resources, that takes thinking about, that takes changing of processes. So it's opportunities, but how do we best integrate this? And is it actually really better? I think we always have to think about um, what are the metrics to show us that we're going in the right direction. Network discovery, so big data to really expand our way to, to solve problems. So we're not all trying to solve the same problems with uh, uh, less uh, less success, can we collectively solve some of these by connecting with each other? Um, high resolution health, using big data to look at population and really better the, uh, the health of populations. And then I think one really important one, which QI has sort of brought us, is rapid prototyping cycles, meaning that you look at a process and you see whether it is working, so what is working well, and you try to make it better with the understanding that you may not make it better and you may fail and actually that might be a desired outcome so then you can improve upon. So going through cycles of failure that actually will increase success. So getting to the topic of the talk, uh, what, is, what is a vision for the Department of Medicine? And I just put up what's actually on the website here and to remind people that a vision in essence underscores who do we want to be, and it's a mouthful, so I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but the mission is who are we or what do we stand for? So, so for a vision, uh, what informs the vision? So in me personally, I think here especially, and again, this list could go on and on. I try to make it succinct so we have time for discussion. but. <clears throat> One thing that stands out to me from the beginning, and I was asked if I if I uh, experienced anything that was surprising to you, and I would say, no, for the most part, I've really just been confirmed in what I saw uh, from when I first visited, and then through my first month here. Um, this is a uh, place with immense intellectual and expertise capital, and every one of you, um, and not just not just faculty, staff, trainees other departments, everywhere you go, there's such a wealth of, of knowledge, expertise, and competence. Um, this is a national academic leader serving a whole region um, and beyond, especially when you look at training. Um, it's a very collaborative environment, and again, I'm saying this because many places are not. Uh, or not as collaborative, and it's, and it's collaborative, and it's evidenced in the many grants that are collaborative grants. It's a very mission-focused faculty. People here really, really care deeply about the mission. But it's also a very entrepreneurial and innovative environment. Everything around you um, is entrepreneurial. You just go to South Lake Union. You, you talk to people outside of medicine. You just go to upper campus. It is, it is humming. It is full of ideas. People are trying to move things forward, think outside the box, and that is evident. Um, it's also a large enterprise with many sites and growing. That could be a challenge as well. 
There's phenomenal students and trainees. This is a pipeline you won't even have to, well, you have to worry about it because it comes to hard work, but many places have a lot harder time recruiting excellent trainees. The trainees here are outstanding. And I don't want to say under leveraged in terms of that not enough has been done, but there's a lot of potential for future advancement. Challenges, well, as we pointed out earlier, threats to mission, and there, there is a focus on margin generating endeavors. There has to be so the lights don't go out, but how do we work in that space of tension where we can do what we want to do, what we thought out to do, um, and focus on our research on our junior faculty pipeline on the teaching uh, while running a patient-centered effective uh, operation that allows us to combine. There's still huge inefficiencies in care delivery, and I know that there's a lot of efforts with the Access Project. There is a huge strategic initiative, but what I'm hearing is there's still a lot of efficiency in how care is being delivered that takes away time from the the, the faculty where they could do other things that, that is difficult for the trainees and it's very difficult for the patients. The access is still challenging. Getting the care, getting to the care is still a big challenge and that again collectively all leads to burnout on all sides. Retention of faculty um, is a challenge. The cost of living here is very high. Um, there's some semi-academic community networks that are attractive. Um, and it is a changing large enterprise. So what is the, what is that? There's a lot of concern. What is the identity of this place going to be once this change is done? Or has the change already happened? Is the mission going to stay the same? What is the strategy? Are we going to be part of the strategy? And is this going to remain or be or become a fully equitable and inclusive place? So with this, um, I want to propose my vision for the department on the bottom. Again, this is the UW Medicine vision, which I didn't change. But my vision, um, and again, mission can be changed, is leverage UW-wide strength to collaboratively build, collaboratively build out its national leadership in mission-based academic research, teaching, and patient care. So how do we get there? And I hope that this will mean that uh, we can implement our vision. So I really think that we can collectively come to a vision and mission that we can work together on. Um, my suggestion is to approach all these challenges, which are ubiquitous, with sp solutions that are specific to here and based specifically on us, on the people who are here and capitalizing on the brain power and on the appetite for change and the intellectual curiosity to, to tackle some of these problems. I would say a lot of these problems and these tensions that we describe in, in itself inherently probably not solvable. But there are ways to address them that can be satisfying and that can move us forward and make us first in class in what we're doing. And I think it will start with defining success. Again, what is the problem? What would failure look like? What would success look like? And then once we define this, I think one, it can be an, on an individual basis, which is very important, and then it will be divisionally and departmentally and have metrics and such. But this will need engagement of all of us so we can collectively define that. And uh, I suggest a shared governance and some of these strategic decisions of where we're going to go. Um, obviously, it's going to be important to continue innovative teaching and have that be a big part of this. Uh, we need to continue to refine the clinical operation. I think this is well underway already, but there's going to be a lot of external factors um, with the inefficiencies of care that really need to be addressed and that seem out of our control, but they need to be addressed so we can move forward and get to our mission. Uh, it will be vital to strategically support research infrastructure and support programmatic growth and leverage the environment that we have with the institutes around us, the collaborators that are around us, the uh, many, many opportunities that may be in some way under-recognized just because the place is so big and there's so many things going on. So having a key uh, navigator to connect all these dots I think will be key. And it's going to be vital to continue and enhance recognition and support of mission-critical efforts. 
people who do the work in research, people who do the teaching. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how to recognize people who are teachers in uh, promotion. How do you add QI into promotion? How do you add diverse and inclusion efforts into promotion? Recognizing these critical efforts that make us all as a department better is going to be vital. And ultimately focus on patient outcomes in healthcare delivery and the opportunity of scholarship as, uh, as such and having trainees involved in all these endeavors. So with this, what do I suggest I do in my first year? So I'm 30 days in. Um, I put up listen, learn, implement, so I'm in a big listening phase. So I'll come to anything and anywhere that my time will allow. I've tried to go to retreats. I want to go to faculty meetings. I've gone to chief's rounds. I've tried to visit uh, any and all sites. Um, and I'm here to listen, and I'm here to learn. Um, uh, all this will help me. Uh, lead some discussions on how we can collectively define success and priority. Um, I think it's going to be vital that we have department-specific goals that emphasize what we care about. Um, and I put up research and teaching, but it could be more than that. And that complements the uh, hospital-wise strategic approach. Um, um, because we're going to be better if we align. So, but we have to know what we want so we can fully align and, and get to where we want to get. Um, and for this, I think, again, as I said, I want to put, uh, have research and teaching benchmarks for us as a department in place so we know we're going in the right direction. Another thing I want to do is continue to assess a departmental processes, and I guess this will be with you. Where can we simplify? Um, it is a large operation. Things are working, and they're working very well, but when people sit down and explain to me how it's working, it's from here to here, and then this bucket, and this person calls this person, then it goes into here, and then it's there. I said, oh, this is complicated. Can you explain it to me again? They're like, well, I try, but it really, it just was sort of set up this way. So can we simplify some of these things? And maybe that's the best way to do it. But I venture to say, I think there's a lot of ways where maybe we can make things more simple, easier to understand, um, and that's where the word transparency comes in. Transparency doesn't mean that everybody knows everything, but it means that it's easy to understand. A lot of things are not easy to understand. Can we work better together? Is there something that somebody's doing that could help somebody else? Um, is it worth to centralize something so more people have access to it? Is, is one group doing something particularly well that other groups would benefit from? Can we be more efficient? What support is needed to be more efficient, to centralize, to simplify? And of course, the commitment to academic mission with all this will remain key or is key to me. Um, faculty and training engagement, I think one of the key things is focusing on morale, and that will be my own metric of success. Um, and how do we really become a fully inclusive work environment? So my dream for three to five years, sustain nationally recognized academic success, where we apply innovative approaches affecting patient outcomes, um, I would love to see productive, engaged faculty and trainees with an academic pipeline, um, efficient care delivery, allowing for superb learning, telehealth, clinical trials for all, and access. Um, I strive to remain the top choice employer, and that includes faculty, trainees, and staff, the place where people want to come and work, where they want to come and learn, where they want to come and train. Um, a diverse and inclusive department with sustained support and an equity of expectation and in delivery of care and a true team approach versus silos. So I leave you with some truisms. Um, challenges are ubiquitous. There is not one solution. People make all the difference and that is what allows for opportunity. Again, you, I've said this a couple of times, but commitment to academic mission is key. That really is at the core of everything we're doing. And change is happening, even if change is hard and it's uncertain, it is, it is already going on. Um, this department, I feel strongly, needs another strong advocate for its mission and somebody who will work well with others. And the future is uncertain, but I believe very exciting. So on that note, change. These are three of our cars on this truck when they're loaded up in Chicago. So on the bottom you see 
silver, red, and black. This is my daughter on the left. She made a new friend. This is my son. He also made a new friend. <laughs> He's onboarding. And my husband is unboxing. And I want to end with thanking you for walking, welcoming us so warmly to Seattle. Thank you. Time for questions. Yes. Steve. Thank you, Barbara. That was a wonderful talk. And I don't think any of us would uh, question for a second um, your ambitious goals for the department and support them enormously. Is it possible to think of those in more quantitative terms? You know, one of the concerns I think we've had is that uh, this department, which you know, in the near recent past was in the top 10 of NIH funding is now 18th. Mm -hmm. Part of that is migration of funding to with global health, but part of it is a real decline over time. Right. Do you, have you thought about where, where this department belongs, looking at our peer institutions and right. where we ought to be in five years? So I think that's an excellent question. Um, to me, it goes back to defining success, and that's actually a discussion I want to have and that we will have. Um, uh, all of you probably know about some of ranking mechanisms. So one is NIH ranking of departments. Others are U.S. News and World Report for clinical. Um, and as all of us are scientists, too, I think the first thing you look at is what is actually being measured. And the other truism, though, is that people like ranks. Um, no matter what it is, if something's being ranked, we do gravitate towards that, and it's important for us when we do hard work that we're being recognized for that. So I think one work we need to do as a department is define what is the metric we want to strive towards, and if the outcome is going to be it is NIH ranking as measured by departmental NIH dollars, then this is where we have to set priorities. I'm not sure that, that may, that's going to be collectively what the metric of success is. It may be. Some of the discussions we've had as well, you know, we train junior faculty, you know, and they're really good, and then they leave and go somewhere else. That could be success too. I'm not saying that is success. I don't have a clear idea of what success is. I think we have to collectively define it. I think there's different ways of looking at it. Once we've decided that NIH ranking is the metric of success, we have to look at it and we have to prioritize. And there's ways with every ranking, there's ways to increase the ranking. Now, is that success? I mean, I'll give you an example, for instance. So, it could be that, you know, with somebody coming, they bring lots of people with them. Or, well, I give you an example of UCSD. So when I was at UCSD, um, you know, my, our dean at that time, big, big, the new dean was a gastroenterologist. And he brought his whole team of scientists. And the GI uh, division, you know, added, I think, 30% in NIH funding because the dean happened to be a gastroenterologist who brought people. Was that the success of the division chief? You know, I love him dearly, but I would say no. Um, did it affect the ranking? Yes. So I think those are the discussions I'm actually looking forward to. We need to define that. But it's also understood if people say this is what I, this is what makes me feel good about working here. It is important to me when I'm on the national stage to work at a place that is under the top so and so many. We looked at the other top places. This is what they do. We need to do this too. That, that's a discussion I want to have, but it's exactly those priorities I want to set. Yes, Ginny. I like what you said about excellence and clinical work and it would be telehealth, it would be clinical trials for all, and it would be access. And this is actually a good fit with our new public facing mantra a higher degree of health care. Um, there have been some challenge in efficient opening of clinical trials. Yes. How would you approach making this work better for the faculty, the trainees, and uh, all involved? Right. So that's a, that's a big fish to fry, having an effective clinical trials unit, because one of those is 
these are structural impediments. So from what I'm learning, and I haven't learned all of it, is that the, again, it goes to centralized versus decentralized. And it seems like the central part, um, there's a lot of compliance involved and can get very clunky and may not serve the individual best. It may actually not serve the institution best. I think, um, but what I've also learned is I've been asking people, how's clinical trials working for you? And I'm getting separate, I'm getting differing answers. So there's actually some subgroups within the department where it seems to be working very well. So they have found their mechanism around it. So I want to learn from the people who've done this well and who have navigated it. And I've asked, I said, could you present to the whole department of what's working for you? Is this something that we should have departmentally as a resource? So if somebody in a division where this is not working well would like to access clinical trials, can get the support they need. So I think we need to learn more about it. I think it's definitely something this department needs. I think this is what the patients need because it's not just care for all, it's clinical trials for all. And as we see uh, a, a, a divergence in health equity, it's also divergence in access to clinical trials. And if we can participate in clinical trials, because by the time we get the paperwork done, the trial is already closed, then we've really missed the mark. So I think there's a, an opportunity um, I think how this will look like, I venture to say it probably will be a group in the division that does it well that we will try to expand to the department and support that endeavor departmentally so that is supported. And we might want to look at, we, look, we said we're going to look at um, is the department structure serving well? We might have to beef up some leadership in that regard too. So clinical trialists and clinical researchers um, have access within the department to some support. Thank you for a terrific talk. Um, thanks for mentioning also morale for staff and um, faculty and trainees and wondering um, what low-hanging fruit you see um, in the area of morale and um, it kind of relates to retention as well. And then what do you see as kind of the big pieces for the long game for, um, for morale for our community? So I think it's a, I was asked a couple of times when I was interviewing and they said, do you realize how big this department is? I said, I, I do realize, but it is a big department. So I think morale is addressed much more easily in a small, uh, for me as a person, in a small environment. But I think the path to morale is engagement and having people be heard and having people have a say. And that is very difficult in healthcare these days, especially as it's getting more and more corporate. And uh, a lot of people feel disengaged with the process, they feel they have no say, they ultimately be held responsible for things they don't control. A lot of morale has to do with the feeling of not having the autonomy to make decisions. I think we have a chance as a department to organize in ways where people can actually um, feel engaged in the department and the processes. And that may be a very high level view, but I think having avenues and opportunities to affect change and to bring in what you came to bring to work. Um, that would be that would be my approach of this. Now, again, as we went back, how do we measure engagement? So I would say one thing, for instance, you know, I looked at Grand Rounds. Um, my first Grand Rounds, it was a great talk, but there were maybe 30 people here. That's not engagement. So what can we do? So one thing I want to do is go back and think, well, why do we have Grand Rounds? Every big department has Grand Rounds. But are people engaged? Well, you could make them go, which some places choose to do, but that wouldn't be engagement. Um, can we do something that's actually useful, that people benefit from, that they want to go to, and what is that? So I would start with asking those questions. And Engagement is something you, the measure, you will, you will know it when you see it. When you have a talk, when you have a room full of people, that's engagement. That means people got up in the morning, they decided to come there, 
and they were interested and if they come again the next week, they're engaged. And you can also see lack of engagement. So I think we'll have to talk about the metrics. I will look to all of you for low-hanging fruit. Sometimes it's very small things or things that seem small that can make a big difference. I think ultimately engagement is uh, people are responsive to feeling cared for. Bill. <laughs> on that note, okay. on that note. Uh, so thank you, Barbara, for a very nice uh, first talk here. We appreciate it. And um, we glad you, we're glad you feel warmly welcome to Seattle. All of us uh, feel that and uh, want to continue that. Uh, I am particularly grateful that you're here. And, <laughs> And I think uh, Jenny is as well. Um, and I know the department uh, as a whole looks forward to working with you for shared success. Thanks. Thank you. I'm glad I'm here too and too late to turn around. <laughs> Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm interested, since the vast majority of um, academic physicians in our department are clinician educators rather than physician scientists, I'm wondering what your vision, your sort of educational vision and vision for advancement and, um, and progression of the sort of educational mission of the residency and the medical school would be. So I think, again, it's very exciting times, and I think the exciting times come with the learners being so different. So I think the opportunities are really to go back to the learner and see what works for them. So being the place where the innovative learning is taking place, just like patient-centered, learner-centered, and from the bottom up, there's reverse learning where we learn from our trainees. And I think there's a lot of techniques. I'm not an expert in medical education, but I know there's a lot of initiatives going on where you can basically assess the curriculum and change it tailored to the learner. So I think with a lot of opportunities, especially as we uh, delve more into the electronic medical health records, on how can we, how can we use the learners in partaking and engaging in these processes that we face. I still feel right now it's siloed. It's the, the teacher does this and then from time to time they teach. It all should be one continuum. Now, it's not easy to do, but this is what I would look to for the um, clinician scholars to do. Hi, Barbara. Welcome to Seattle after all. <laughs> um, I, I uh, was really gratified to hear that you kept a letter I wrote to you some years ago and that has so-called shaped your career. Now, this is an example par excellence of what UW stands for, what we do, and what you said have recharged my faith in what we have been doing. So, um, but I also want to offer a small dose of advice to you. This is a big job, a complex job. The first thing you need to think about is to take good care of yourself. You must be a happy woman, because if you're not, it's very difficult for all of us here. So um, how are you <laughs> going to divide your time? Yes. And, and that's something only you can tell. Mm -hmm. And I would, if I were you, preserve some individual private space for your own career and don't sacrifice all yourself on behalf of us because if you do not retain a small part for yourself, you stop being Barbara Young. Thank you. There's nothing that can follow that, so thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Yeah.
But yeah, one more round of applause. Thank you, Barbara.